We're going to go ahead and get started with the um, next panel. Um, this panel is sponsored by Hollis Cobb. Uh, we currently cannot locate anyone from Hollis Cobb, but if we find them, we will let them introduce themselves and say something about their company at the end. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Danielle Epps, who has agreed to moderate it for us. And this is the uh, Revenue Cycle Leading in Times of Uncertainty panel. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, so again, my name is Danielle Epps. I am the Director of Healthcare, uh, Healthcare Advisory Services for Wyndham Brannan. We are one of the oldest and largest CPA firms in the Atlanta area offering revenue cycle assessments, transformations, interim leadership, so on and so forth. Uh, we have a great panel today. Uh, and I want to start with Jay Mary, who's on virtually. And I'd like to ask that everyone introduces themselves. Jay? Hey, good, good afternoon, guys. Um, my name is Jay Mary. I'm the Director of Revenue Cycle for Union General Health Systems up in Blairsville, Georgia. I've um, been here for seven years, and we are um, a growing organization and have been very busy as of late. <laughs> All right. Matt? Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Matt Fisher. I'm Director of Revenue Cycle for Piedmont Healthcare. Um, been in Piedmont for about five, a little over five and a half years now. Um, and uh, I oversee all self-pay activities, charity and financial aid, and scanning and ind indexing for the entire organization. Georgia Ann. I'm Geor Georgia Ann Phillips, um, Administrative Director of Revenue Cycle, University Hospital or University Healthcare System out of Augusta, Georgia. Cinnamon Kennard, Vice President of Revenue Cycle at Tanner Medical Center. I've only been there nine months. <laughs> and before <laughs> that, I was at Piedmont and Gwinnett Hospital. And um, I'm Vanessa Carter, I'm the patient access Director for St. Joseph Candler Health System here in Savannah, Georgia, and I've been there going on my third year. Fantastic. Thank you all. So the purpose of this panel is really to discuss leading during times of uncertainty, which has been very uncertain for the last 18 months. I think everyone would agree. Um, but each panelist was asked to participate because of their thought leadership, their leadership experience, and the roles they hold at their respective organizations. Uh, comments that they made were based on their experience and their challenges. Uh, that they have encountered at their organizations during the pandemic and represent perspectives on the topics that we'll discuss. Um, but before we begin, I have a question. By a show of hands, how many of you have encountered organizational challenges this last 18 months that you never thought that you would face in your roles or even during your career? <laughs> right. Leading during times of uncertainty. Um, so some of the topics that we're going to discuss are workforce shortages, uh, governmental funding, revenue, cash collections per month, uh, and the vaccine mandates. So again, this last 18 months, I believe, will be one for the history books and for medical journals. So let's t uh, start our discussion. So starting with Vanessa, uh, hospital leaders have faced unprecedented times since March 2020, starting with, for several hospitals, large and small, the rapid deployment, thank you, the rapid deployment of staff to remote working environment. So Vanessa, we all had to make tough decisions during the height of COVID. From a logistical standpoint, did your hospital choose to rapidly deploy your staff to a remote work environment? We actually did not. Um, we made the decision that um, since we had um, clinical staff, doctors and nurses that had to be at the hospital, they couldn't go home, they had to be at the bedside, that we would stay there to support them. And so, you know, it presented different challenges for us because, of course, the staff is listening to, they've got friends, family, and other people within the community that are working from home, um, and they wanted to work from home. And so we really had to uh, sell them on the, on the vision and also answer all their concerns because they were scared. I mean, mm -hmm. people were literally dying, and what, what they're saying every day is stay home, stay mm -hmm. home. Mm -hmm. And we were telling them, no, you can't stay home. You need to come. So we had to um, address their fears, um, mm -hmm. and we did that. Uh, in a myriad of ways. Uh, we had the areas um, assessed to see, you know, what was the safest thing to do for them. I think we were probably the first to pass out masks. And we literally, we gave fresh masks to um, employees every day. We rounded on them um, to make sure that they were safe. And we huddled with them every day. And we, you know, we heard everything that they said and we tried to address everything that they said. And so about the time we got everybody, you know, really on board that that's the vision, we're gonna support um, our clinicians uh, and we're gonna come to work. Um, then the schools closed. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So now we had a bunch of parents that needed to figure out what to do with their children. And the answer for them was to go home because that's what everybody was doing. Everybody's working from home, the kids are at home and that was convenient. So we again decided, no, we're still gonna, we're gonna stay here and we're gonna support everybody. So um, St. Joseph Candler, which is a very unique um, organization, decided that, okay, what do they need to be supported? We're gonna support them and what they did is we became the school mm -hmm. um, and aftercare. So uh, we actually leased um, a, a school that was closed and we had our staff bring their children during the day. They could bring them as early as 7.30 in the morning and they could pick them up as late as 6.15. They did the homework with them so the parent didn't have to worry about homework. We did homework. They did, they had a whole, it was a whole system. It wasn't daycare, you didn't just drop them off. Um, they exercised, it was school and it didn't cost the employees anything. And so that's how we managed it. Yeah. So I have a follow-up question from Matt. Your organization, Piedmont, had a strong foundation of remote work prior to the pandemic. Your organization chose to send staff home at the onset of the shutdown. How did this impact, if at all, any of your internal processes? So originally, I mean, remote work has been something that we'd been talking about at Piedmont and prior organizations for years. Um, we had a fairly solid foundation. There was still some bumps that we had to get over um, inside of a two-week turnaround and we were able to turn it around inside of two weeks we sent the entire staff home and the, the, the entire team was so excited to be able to go home and the next thing we knew we were combating dogs barking and doorbells ringing and the Amazon person dropping off packages and maintenance guys and maintenance yeah exactly <laughs> and then yeah. and then child care mm -hmm. on top of that um, so with everything that we had already put in place, we already had the cloud-based telephony systems in place. Um, we had the VMware and the, and the virtual desktop infrastructure already set up. Um, so it was just a manager, ma matter of getting everybody access. But the problem we ran into was we had to send everybody, send everybody home in two weeks and we couldn't get everybody their own computers. So they were working on their own computers at the time. And some of our folks were working off of hotspots and some of them were working on dial-up. I didn't know dial-up still, still existed, <laughs> um, but they were still working off of dial-up and, and very slow connections. So once we got over all of those humps and got them the stuff that they needed, um, the staff were so excited and next thing you know, their engagement goes through the roof. But similar to, to what Vanessa had commented on, um, our organization had put in place a, uh, a, a child care system um, through a partnership called Bright Horizons and we were able to provide child care to the staff um, for a period of time, it was at no cost to them. Um, I think that lasted, keep me honest, six <laughs> months, I think. <laughs> I think about six months. Um, so we were able to provide child care to them at no cost um, at, a, at a variety of different um, standalone organizations. So that really helped um, the working families, the working moms and the working dads that um, needed that support. And um, But the engagement went through the roof. The staff loved it. They really did. Um, they didn't have to commute anymore. They didn't have to fight Atlanta traffic. They didn't have to fight I-85 collapsing, whatever the case may be that day. Um, you know, the best thing they had to do was manage a couple of Legos in the floor from their bedroom to their office. So mm -hmm. <laughs> it was, it worked out great. Fantastic. Um, if that had been an option of mine when my children were smaller, I would have been so grateful. Um, so in terms of staffing, a large majority of the urban hospitals in the Atlanta area, we've learned, have been recruiting staff from rural hospitals, offering higher wages for the same, ex uh, you know, duties, but then off also offering remote work. Jay, uh, from the union general standpoint, how has this impacted your organiz organization, if at all? Yeah, I mean, quite significantly, actually. And um, I know I'm going a little different perspective than some of the larger systems that are represented there. Um, you know, in the, in the rural environment, we, we naturally have suppressed wages, uh, those wages that are representative of, uh, of obviously our locale. Um, and then, of course, uh, oftentimes there's not the geographic infrastructure for, for uh, high-speed internet and so forth that, that, uh, that, that rep are represented here versus in the, in the urban arena. Um, we have struggled for quite a while, obviously, from a recruiting standpoint. We, we have a natural labor pool here, which is respective of the location, of course, in our, in our community. 
Um, we did a gr great job, I think, leading up to, to the COVID, COVID pandemic, uh, managing our staffing, but it did impact us fairly significantly. Um, obviously, you know, the bigger, the bigger employers in the Atlanta area, of course, are offering higher wages depending you know, on where they're located. And then, of course, there's the opportunity to, for remote work for those for those, those employees as well. And so um, we're trying to bring people in. They're pulling us away, pulling them away because they've got the opportunity for telework uh, there in the, in, the, in, the, in the Atlanta area or the, any other big cities, allowing for that remote work to be a possibility for those employees. So it's really become a, a sort of a, a significant challenge for us. And, and we thought that uh, with the advent of telework, and, and again, we do have high speed internet here, uh, and 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 a lot of our employees have the ability to to work remotely, um, but but it's it's worked quite the opposite in that a lot of our employees are going home working remotely versus us actually pulling people in from the from the big cities to work for a smaller system like Union General. Um, so it's it's been quite a challenge. Uh, obviously, you know, with uh, you know with with uh, margins being what they are and costs, of course, going up, uh, maintaining good staffing uh, throughout this pandemic, and, and we really don't see that leveling off. Well, thank you for that, Jay. And in terms of rural hospitals, um, they have, to your point, been historically challenged with their geographical locale, competitive wages, and this coupled with the uh, newly announced federal mandate in September could potentially have an impact on all hospitals, large and small. And we at Wyndham Brandon believe that this could also impact hospitals in the Atlanta area um, as nation hospitals nationwide may begin recruiting from our hospitals in the Atlanta area. Um, so let me ask this of Cinnamon. How do you think the mandate may impact, um, you know, the fact that, or not the mandate, I'm sorry, the fact that the larger hospitals, let's say in California, a large hospital in San Francisco could potentially recruit someone from your hospital. The wage index mm -hmm. in California is extremely, a lot higher than that of a rural hospital in Georgia. So in terms of your thoughts as a rural hospital leader, what are your thoughts on recruiting from a larger geographical location and offering the option for remote work? Well, to basically repeat what Jay said, um, we had the same challenges. Our pay scales are really not competitive at all to the bigger hospitals. And then we have the internet um, issues. Mm -hmm. um, we have those greatly at, um, out in Carrollton and Alabama. And so, but what's interesting is as our organization is looking at trying, trying to bring us more competitively with the salaries, we are challenged with now the non-clinical roles are putting, being put at the bottom of the list of importance. Mm -hmm. And if you think about, we heard respiratory therapists are now able to mandate $100 or more an hour because of that shortage. And so the hospital is challenged with where do we get the money to bring up the clinical to meet the market demand and the shortage? And then what's happening now to the non-clinical roles where we are having that same struggle with workforce, but we're not being approved at that rate. Mm -hmm. So our executive team is really looking at how to strategize the, all of the positions and look at the market and become competitive. Um, from a revenue cycle perspective at Tanner, we've not been remote except coders. And so we're looking to really explore some of those things, but with the internet issues that we have, the, the speed levels, mm -hmm. um, we're looking at flexible scheduling and just getting creative mm -hmm. with how to you know, lure people because our pay sadly is not competitive mm -hmm. and um, we're not gonna be able to capture people. Now, I will say we have some, we have seen some benefit from the mandate mm -hmm. where people don't want to have the vaccine and so they're coming to other organizations that are not mandating it at this time. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we're seeing some benefit from that. Right. Um, so in terms of the mandate that the federal government just announced in September, um, this is going to, in my opinion, affect for those hospitals that do not have a mandate this could potentially affect your revenue cycle staff. So uh, Matt, do you think that this mandate is going to have an impact on the hospitals where the mandate for vaccines has not been implemented, you know, as, as far as the locale is concerned? 
I mean, I absolutely do. I think ultimately everybody's headed that direction. Um, but we're going to get to a point to where if a, a person leaves one organization because they do not have a mandate, they're going to get stuck between a rock and a hard place eventually. And they're not going to be able to go work for the next organization because every organization is going to put in a mandate. Um, I mean, I was very fortunate and I've got um, 80 plus people on my team um, and I lost one um, from the vaccine mandate. Um, but I think there's a lot of just general uneducated, if, that, if that's even the right term, um, just perception of the, of the vaccine mandate. They feel that if they leave the organization because they're not going to get vaccinated, that they're going to be eligible for unemployment and, you know, be able to collect all of those benefits and those kinds of things. And unfortunately, it's just it's just not the case. Mm -hmm. um, but the benefit to being in a fully remote environment is we do have uh, a nationwide pool of candidates now that we have not had before. So the organizations that have have implemented a vaccine mandate for those that are unvaccinated, if they can tag on to um, a remote workforce somewhere somehow, um, their options are endless as in, mm -hmm. in the U.S. So, um, but. I, we originally thought the vaccine mandate was really going to put a strain on revenue cycle, even in the remote space. And uh, surprisingly enough, we lost um, less than 1%. That's fantastic. Um, so I want all of you all to weigh in, including you, Jay, uh, virtually there. One of the things we recognize as consultants is the strategies that we used in the past to manage our staff are no longer relevant. What are you doing differently to stay engaged with your staff? Jay? Can we start with you? Repeat the question. I'm sorry. It's it was breaking up on that. Sorry about that. I said one of the things we recognize as consultants is the strategies we used in the past to manage staff are no longer re relevant. So what are you doing differently to stay engaged with your staff? Well, of course, just communication. Um, communication, uh, staying in touch with staff, listening to their concerns. Uh, doing our best to address those concerns. Uh, obviously, there's there's a lot of variables in in this in this day in which we operate, specifically the the COVID nineteen day. Uh, everyone's concerned about wages. They're concerned about uh, the amount of hours they're working. Uh, they're concerned about stability. Uh, they're concerned about uh, a host of things. Um, you know, time off. You know, et cetera. We really are just doing our best to listen to our employees and to address their concerns as they come up. Uh, obviously, an open door policy, uh, regular communication uh, with 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 managers and and frontline staff have been have been beneficial. But I'd like to kind of weigh in. I know there was some discussion. Uh, you, you skipped over a little bit the the, the specific question about uh, the mandate effect, and I, I wanted to comment as I, I I see that affecting the rural hospital market. Um, I think it's going to be a little different for us than, than, than maybe the Atlanta area is seeing uh, for a variety of reasons. And we, A, the, the, the mandate is really not, at least as I understand it, fully effective yet. Is There's certainly rumors of that, and I know it's swirling. Um, we've not lost many yet as a result, but I, 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 I'm, I would argue that we would lose potentially 20 to 25 percent of our current staff in certain areas of the revenue cycle should that actually become a, a, a full-blown mandate. Um, a few reasons for that, you know, I think, <clears throat> um, of course, pay sensitivity in the market, which we've talked about, vaccination rates in our our local market, as well as a general any unacceptance of vaccine. And I think, obviously, the the you know the the <clears throat> conservative nature of this location is plays in a play, plays a part in that. Um, alternate source sources of employment. So again, we're finding ourselves compete with the Arby's of the world, the you know the Starbucks and and some of the other. Uh, really competitors that you wouldn't consider, you know, a year ago or 18 mm -hmm. months ago. Um, and then finally, continued unemployment benefits under COVID-19. Uh, so the people are going somewhere. They're, they're threatening to go somewhere. I know that uh, we they're, they're touting historical unemployment rates uh, at the moment, but, but certainly we're not seeing that. So I think a lot of those things are kind of hanging in the wings. And if this mandate goes through, um, at least from a rural standpoint, I think we could be in real trouble as it relates to our revenue cycle. Yeah, I think the last that I read, the mandate, if it passes, should be, uh, everyone needs to be mandated by, I believe, November 22nd. I think that was the last date that I saw. So, uh, Matt, can you weigh in on that? What are you doing differently to stay engaged with your staff? 
one of the things that we quickly realized when we sent everybody home was engagement went up very fast when we sent everybody home. Um, and I think some of our leadership team, myself included, really kind of took advantage of that, the fact that engagement went up and we neglected to continue that level of engagement as time went on. And then we started to see engagement and productivity start to slip. Um, here we are 18 months in and um, engagement started to go down. So <clears throat> one of the things that we've done um, that I just recently started, um, we want the staff, when, when we had a physical office space, a brick and mortar, um, I would always encourage my staff at any time, feel free to stick your head in my office. We can have a conversation about, you know, how's your mom and them? You know, what's going on with the kids? What's keeping you up at night? What's giving you headaches? Whatever the case may be, come in and talk. If my door is open, you're welcome to come in and talk. Well, I don't have a physical door anymore, so um, I started a chat with Matt series um, with all of my staff, and it's a scheduled time that we can talk about football or pumpkin spice lattes or whatever the case may be. I mean, they're welcome to talk about anything that we want to talk about, but it's that time with the staff to just have a conversation with with me. Their managers and supervisors are not allowed to be there. It's just the staff and the director. Um, so that has been fantastic. We've had several of those sessions already, but I had to make it a point to make that intentional um, and be very intentional and schedule that time for the staff because I find myself, at, we all do, we find ourselves getting too busy all the time. And if we don't make a time for our staff, then our staff are just going to start to get a little on the sour side mm -hmm. um, and that engagement's going to slip. Yeah. George Ann? So when the pandemic first started, um, I don't know if you all experienced the same thing in your facilities, but we had the Air Force flying over the hospital saluting. We had the fire trucks coming through the front of the hospital honking their horns and doing all of that. We had the community come out and park cars for the night shift and they would turn the lights on all at the same time. Yeah. We had uh, nurseries provide 5,000 hanging, beautiful hanging baskets for one for every employee mm -hmm. for the hospital. Nurses were touted, healthcare workers were touted as the heroes mm -hmm. of the world <laughs> at that point. Mm -hmm. And as this pandemic has worn on, you know, we felt we felt that all originally. It was, it was a boost uh, for morale. But I would have to say one of our biggest challenges right now is this issue of morale. All of that is gone. Mm -hmm. There is no Air Force flying over. There are no fire trucks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, they don't do the meals and things anymore. They used to, you know, Chick-fil-A and all of that. Um, so all of that's gone. So now we do feel it within our or the whole organization. Um, we had a little pep rally by our CEO, and he's like, come on, people. Y'all need to be happy. You know, we need to get with it. We need to be there we, as leaders of the organization. And so we've started doing some things within the organization. They do pancake breakfast where the, you know, the mm -hmm. C-suite comes mm -hmm. in and serves. They've, they've, you know, on Fridays, everybody wears their team jerseys. It's mm -hmm. small things mm -hmm. that they're starting to do um, to help with that. Um, speaking of the the vaccine mandate, we have not put that mandate in, but it was very, very, very strongly encouraged. And our CEO spoke to that and was very um, uh, in, encouraging and forceful in, in his presentation with that. And it almost backfired a little bit throughout the organization because some of the nurses felt bullied mm. up on the floors by some of the staff that were vaccinated versus those that were not. Mm -hmm. So then we had to say, okay, bullying won't be tolerated. <laughs> we <laughs> have to respect everybody's position mm -hmm. on where they are with the, uh, until this is mandated. So we've, it's been a wild roller coaster ride, to be mm -hmm. honest with you. But as far as engaging with our staff, um, I think the productivity was sort of our brass ring. Um, in order to be able to be able to go off site and work remotely, which is what everybody you know was thought they wanted to do. Some didn't think they wanted to do that, um, but a lot of them 
did think that they want to do that. They, their productivity had to be consistently mm -hmm. at or above target. Mm -hmm. So, boy, you talk about getting everybody on the same page real quick. How's my productivity today? We never heard that before. Mm -hmm. So they became very interested in that. And in order to maintain their status of being able to work remotely, they have to sustain their productivity stats. Um, if they don't, they have to come in and mm -hmm. it's almost like a remedial, hey, we need to get you back up to par. Mm -hmm. We also um, had to go off site so quickly. The only folks within our revenue cycle that were remote workers initially were the our coders. Mm -hmm. And so we had a coding manager that had done a phenomenal job with her remote staff. And so we had a little session with her right at the beginning of the pandemic about how did you do this? What works? What doesn't work? How do you stay engaged with your folks? How often are you literally in the office versus how often do you maintain, you know, in your your home office? So that was very helpful to the rest of our crew. Mm -hmm. But we had some outbreaks of COVID right in the very beginning in mm -hmm. our CBO, our physician billing office. And we literally had to va evacuate those offices uh, like overnight and quickly get people out of a couple of work environments. So we had infection control come in and evaluate the workspace to make sure that everybody was six feet apart, they could social distance and all of that. And so that drove, make it having a safe environment mm -hmm. for our employees really drove a lot of, of the early stages of working remote. Mm -hmm. Um, so, it, it, surprisingly, it has worked beautifully for us. The productivity is definitely there, uh, and we are able to sustain it. And so, we, we've had a lot of success with that. Fantastic. So, that's worked good for us. Cinnamon? So, I had the advantage of being new to come in and do things a little differently. <laughs> so, um, instead of calling it culture reset, because that had a negative tone to it, um, I called it realigning associate engagement. We had a mascot um, survey among everybody in Revenue Cycle, so when the mascot was selected, we then had a contest with artists in the group to draw the um, mascot. So we have a roadrunner who's our mascot. His name is Revy, R-E-V-Y. Um, he is the foundation of all of our communication. Um, we also are launching a recognition program called raving you, uppercase you, because it sounds like revenue. <laughs> um, so we're doing that. We also have cascaded all of our goals in the SMART format to every position in Revenue Cycle. And it is literally a matrix. And every, every associate gets one to three goals that are cascaded from the executive um, level, myself, my CFO. So we did that. That has been phenomenal. The associates are engaged. They can talk to what our goals are. Um, and we are also granting them all access to look at the dashboards, um, financial pulse, things of that nature. So they know where we are. Mm -hmm. And when they're in line, we can achieve the goals. So when I got there, CFB was, I think, 18. Um, I started February 1st. And we hit the goal by April 30th, which was 4.5. And we're under that now. I think our lowest one was 2.8. But associates are engaged. And mm -hmm. we did that all just through involving people. And we also have a team of associates um, that help us recognize things that need to be done. So we're doing that. Um, we have a workplace page where all the communication, we're building that out. Um, patient access, my patient access director is very good. He had already started a workplace page. So anything communication-wise goes out to that team. We're building that out for revenue cycle. Um, and then we're also setting new standards for productivity. And we'll do more with that. Fantastic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Vanessa? Well, um, we did several things um, as a company. I mean, we still often, we're having food trucks regularly, mm -hmm. which is my favorite thing. <laughs> uh, we're feeding them all the time. I mean, we're always having some, something going on. I think they have a food basket going on today that mm -hmm. everybody's picking up. But um, in my area, uh, we, what I like to do is I, I round on everybody often, um, and I like to hear what's going on with them. Mm -hmm. And whatever concerns they have, I try to make it my business to address it quickly and to let them know mm -hmm. um, 
that I address it. I always say, I look at my job as like I'm the um, waiter mm -hmm. uh, or the waitress in a five-star restaurant. My job is to make sure that you have a good, ex uh, experience. A good experience. Mm -hmm. So when I round on the employees, I can we can ask them um, questions and huddles, and there are always those that won't talk, that don't speak um, in front of everybody. But when I round, I find out all these little things that are going wrong that really matter to them. Mm -hmm. You know, their computer's not working right, or the printer does this, or this fax machine is not hooked up. And I make it a point to take care of those things mm -hmm. right away. Mm -hmm. If I hear that somebody is leaving, um, I go to them right away, you know, just just talk to them. I congratulate them. I make sure that they understand, you know, that's, that's okay with us. But it is really, um, as Matt said, it's communication, mm -hmm. communication, communication. And um, I like to communicate in ways and reward things that are cheap and sustainable. So it doesn't cost anything <laughs> and we can do it often. So thank yous are always cheap mm -hmm. uh, and you can always give many of them. So I send thank you cards to the house sometimes. But I definitely, if I catch them being good, so to speak, and I try to, um, if they're blowing, if they're um, blowing all the goals out the water, I make sure that I say that both to them and then um, in front of the group. So mm -hmm. I'll send out an email that says, "Hey, kudos to um, whoever," and that really makes a difference, especially when they know I'm looking at it mm -hmm. and I notice that what they're doing. And I do that often. Yeah, yeah. the personal last touch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I want to shift um, to the topic of women in the workplace. An overwhelming number of women are leaving the workforce. We were just talking about this earlier. They are calling this the great resignation, or the year of the great resignation. Uh, I read from Harvard Business School that in July, I believe, there were 4.5 million people who quit or resigned from their jobs. In August, there were 4.7. Have no idea where they're going, but the women in the workforce before the pandemic they uh, had significant uh, opportunities in executive positions, and women in the workforce had uh, opportunities overall. Since the onset of COVID, households have shifted back to more traditional roles, which has added an approximated 18 hours of additional work per week for the woman, uh, you know, leading the woman to opt out of the workforce, otherwise known again as the Great Resignation. Oftentimes, revenue cycle departments are staffed heavily by women. So, Vanessa. How is your organization planning to mitigate the risk of staff who are burned out and plan to resign? Well, you know, we're, we've been having discussions around that quite a bit, and Patrick, our fearless leader, um, has been meeting with the um, senior leadership team about what we can offer and mm -hmm. uh, what we can do to make sure that we're addressing the concerns that um, staff has. Um, and uh, Patrick kind of keeps his ear to the ground with, with our staff to know, you know, if they're leaving, why are they leaving, mm -hmm. and what we can do. So it really is, hearing what's going on with the staff and why people are leaving the workforce and seeing how can we address that. Mm -hmm. You know, we really want to um, address how can we keep uh, those people, those star players, as opposed to, you know, we can just recruit somebody else or we can, you know, um, mm -hmm. pay somebody else more. Mm -hmm. It's what can we really do that matters mm -hmm. to people that are leaving the workforce. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, to your point, um, your, your organization did a great job of helping your staff, you know, throughout COVID as far as supplying the, um, the school type environment, you know, meals and things like that. But I mean, my daughter is in high school and working on my computer 14 hours a day because I'm in front of my computer is right there. Mm -hmm. uh, but then also helping her if she needed with her homework, then also making sure she ate, you know, her meals and things like that. That's adding on to, you know, the traditional role for the woman in the household. So, um, i just like to ask, Georgian, do you have anything to add to that? Well, the problem is actually a little bit worse even than what you're talking about, mm -hmm. because not only are we experiencing younger women with small children mm -hmm. that are leaving the workforce, and it's not just to take care of the children. Mm -hmm. A lot of times they will say, I've got to take care of my mother. Mm -hmm. who is, mm -hmm. And so we're hearing a lot of, it's all the whole family is depending on this uh, person. And then you've got those uh, retirements. I did three retirements week before last before I came down here. I remember when we were and, prepping. Yeah. And, but they had been there 42, 45, and 36 years. It's hard to say, Can, can't you work another five years? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> They've deserved the right to, <laughs> to celebrate that. The, the problem is that there's nobody in the ranks to backfill those positions. Mm -hmm. The applicant pool is also gone Dwindling. along with this. Mm -hmm. And so for every person that leaves, it takes, I mean, I can hire five people, but only three of them may show up for 
orientation. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, oh my goodness, I accidentally got a job. I didn't really mean to, <laughs> so I don't think I'll show up. Or they'll be there for a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. and we've never experienced that mm -hmm. in our revenue cycle before. So we did, and we're experiencing it not only in access services, but in our patient financials department as well. Mm -hmm. So we had a powwow with our C-suite folks and HR and talked through all the possibilities of things that we could consider. We also were in the situation of not being leaders in the market with a salary, and so that's a challenge mm -hmm. for us. So we mm -hmm. had to do a market analysis uh, that we just completed, and we're competing with P we're competing with PCAs that are now demanding $2 more per hour to mm -hmm. do the work that they do, and mm -hmm. they have to have that. So the hospital is having to decide where to put this funding. Um, but uh, we are looking at things like potentially retention bonuses. Mm -hmm. We're looking at um, the foundation has stepped up and said that they will provide funding for one uniform for every employee and all new hires, mm -hmm. which is nice. They're also uh, offering to provide educational materials for there to get them their CHA or their CHAM certifications mm -hmm. or their CPAR, mm -hmm. um, several things like that. It's gonna take a package deal right. of things to really make that work. Mm -hmm. So to retain. That, those are the things that we're, we're looking at doing. Fantastic, thank you for that. Um, as leaders, we need to recognize in the revenue cycle, most of the staff members make low wages and live paycheck to paycheck. Uh, recently, the eviction moratorium expired, and when I worked for St. Joseph's, there was an emergency loan program that the nuns had put in place for staff. Revenue cycle departments were overwhelmingly the only departments that had the highest number of loans that were assigned or approved for the staff members because of the fact that their families faced hardships. But I believe families are in need now more than ever. We were just talking earlier about how expensive have, have doubled grocery costs, uh, a pack of chicken thighs, $11.99. That's ridiculous. <laughs> so, um, Cinema, I'd like to ask you, does your organization have programs in place or are there plans to implement programs such as the emergency loans to support staff and their families who may be impacted by the moratorium or other hardships that have come into play since COVID? We don't have a loan program <clears throat> um, where someone can apply for a loan, but we do have some funding where someone comes on hardships. They can basically share their hardship and then, you know, share what they need assistance with and it's typically granted. I don't know of any that have been turned down. I know of a few associates since I've been there that have gone through the fund and have gotten the fund. So. Fantastic. Uh, George Ann, can you add on to that? Uh, we do not have the emergency loan program, but I think that is a fabulous idea. Um, we also have what we call helping hands through our foundation mm -hmm. and people in need can submit an application for assistance with their mortgage, mm -hmm. uh, the water bill, mm -hmm. the car payment, mm -hmm. you know, the essentials, things like that. Um, we also have a Secret Santa thing that we do every year, which I think is fantastic. And employees throughout the hospital that are in need uh, list out the number of children and their ages and mm -hmm. whether they're male or female and what their preferences are and a department and we've done this every year in in access services and throughout the revenue cycle we adopt an entire family mm -hmm. and we do Santa Claus and we do it big I mean it will have I have bicycles in my office <laughs> and hula hoops, hula hoops and all this stuff and um, so um, it, it's a really a, a great service and we provide Christmas and it's typically for grandparents who are raising their children's children, children mm -hmm. oh, awesome. is what we usually see as the situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're always more than happy to help in those circumstances. But we have helped with some childcare uh, that was mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know that was one of the needs um, during the pandemic as well. So we've done some of that, helping find resources for that. Fantastic. Something that I learned a long time ago when I started at DeKalb Medical Center is not only are our patients our customers, but we as team members are customers of each other. And we have to support each other and be yeah. very kind and empathetic and things like that, especially as leaders, yeah. right? I, and I will say that we have a very, very strong sense of community within many 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 of the departments throughout the organization and if some if a if an area becomes aware mm -hmm. they will all pitch it everybody just 
you know huddles around them and and so we still we still have that you know fantastic which is good thank you um, so we have a few minutes left and I want to open up for questions but I do just have two more questions as it relates to payer behaviors um, they changed and they seem to kind of relax a little bit during COVID uh, where denial percentages decreased and some age claims were adjudicated quickly. In early mid to mid uh, 2021, payer behaviors returned to normal or even more aggressive, uh, presenting leaders with unforeseen challenges, particularly with staffing shortages. So um, Matt, I'd like to start with you. How have you and your leaders prioritized or reprioritized your staff's activities to address the aggressive payer denials? I think one of the things that we had to um, push out education to all of the, the staff that are on my team, when COVID first hit, a lot of the payers were waiving uh, patient liability and there's still funding from HRSA and several things along those lines. And patients have unfortunately become accustomed to that and the payers are starting to reverse that behavior and they're billing to patients now. So the patients are calling my team upset saying hey I was COVID positive why am I getting billed for this mm -hmm. uh, because Blue Cross said you're responsible mm -hmm. um, so if you have a problem with that you need to go talk to Blue Cross mm -hmm. and you know we ended up in this in this conversation with the <clears throat> excuse me with the with the patients and their payers saying well I, I got a COVID test why am I being billed for a COVID test mm -hmm. why am I being billed for a telehealth visit why am I being billed for X Y and Z because there was so much publicity around not being billed for those things when COVID first started, it has now become a re-education of the general patient population. Mm -hmm. And we are trying to do that both proactively and reactively when they call in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, organizationally, we're trying to push some of that re-education out. We're hoping that the payers are able to do the same thing. Um, but it's just now it's become a general re-education of general population to mm -hmm. say that just because you're COVID positive, doesn't mean that you don't owe us anything we provided you with a service mm -hmm. we expect to be reimbursed for that service both from your payer and from you as the patient mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. thank you Jay could you add on to that for us yeah you know I'm gonna say 100% ditto um, with respect to you know kind of how we're handling the increase in denials and patient due liabilities post COVID-19 I, I would I would echo Matt's sentiments man I think uh, really staff education has been paramount for us um, he's right in that, you know, a lot of the patients became uh, accustomed to, to those patient due liabilities being picked up by, you know, specific federal programs and or uh, payer labels uh, during the pandemic, which have since gone away and or in the process of, of going away. So absolutely, we've had to equip our staff, you know, with that material. Um, it, it's, it's, it's constant. It seems like we're, we're constantly getting it at the administrative level, at least in my seat. Uh, you know, patient complaints that are coming in as a result of that, uh, what I call um, uh, real unknown or, or just, just false information concerning their liabilities concerning care after COVID or as a result of COVID-19. So I think that's a big part of that. Another thing we're doing really is just um, actively evaluating payer denial is using, using specific analytical tools and then trying to shift, you know, resources internally. Uh, denial management has been a big thing uh, at Union General over the past six or eight months. I know our CFO is has really um, leaned on myself and, and our business office director to, to begin to put our hands around those uh, as a whole and look at ways we can improve our management of them, uh, specifically with the existing workforce. And I know, uh, you know, to everyone's prior point, you know, staffing becomes a, a part of that and a, and a factor in that specific challenge. But I think technology can help in that. Uh, managing productivity, uh, looking at trends over time uh have all helped us and i think you know again i think as we go forward and payers continue to to really put a grip on their on their reimbursement for care we provided i think those tools are going to be necessary as in as we spoke to um communication internally and, and looking at those payer guidelines looking at payer policies uh being transparent about what we know and then trying to communicate that to the patients as we can uh, in order to to help maintain patient satisfaction also so i think at least in our market uh, we 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 want to maintain that satisfaction, maintain our, our presence as uh, as a as a central provider, and and I think that comes with uh, educating them on what we know. Um, you know, we we provide a service and we have to get paid, and uh, we have to keep the lights on, and we have to maintain a margin, and so uh, we we want to balance all those things that you know carefully as we move forward in time. But COVID has thrown us a weird loop, um, but I think again communication uh, is has been pivotal in that. Thank you so much, Jay. So the last question that I have before we wrap up and open the floor for questions um, is I want to ask everyone on the panel, 
What are the top two challenges your organization encountered during the pandemic? Starting with Vanessa. Top two challenges, of course, were um, the fear of the um, employees, them being afraid, and then, um, of course, um, fatigue mm -hmm. uh, with um, both the clinical staff and even our staff because there was a lot coming at them that was different, it was new, and they were trying to balance what's different and new at work, mm -hmm. and then there were things that were going on with their families, and then, you know, quite frankly, some of them um, got COVID. Mm -hmm. So it was the, the staff fatigue and supporting them because uh, everybody was just kind of worn out emotionally mm -hmm. during that time. So if there was a perfect storm, it happened at Tanner. It's before I got there. They went live on Epic in November of 2019, and then a few months later, COVID hit. And it was really hard on the organization, and they actually furloughed a lot of the business office revenue cycle positions. Um, so then the VP left and I came in, and so we are just really focused on a lot of things. And one of the things that we're seeing now with the denial perspective is a lot of the payers are recouping those COVID, those COVID payments. And we're trying to figure out what that is and why. So um, look at that, just heads up. <laughs> so I would have to say our, our biggest challenge has been managing resources, human resources. Mm -hmm. In the early days of the pandemic, when we were closing down elective surgeries, we had more staff than we had volume. And we had needs in the front of the hospital for greeters to take temperatures and check people in and do all of that. And, uh, but, it, but we also had nurses that did not have work at that juncture too. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the whole hospital became engaged in how do you fill those positions up front and not have you know, the bottom fall out with your productivity because you don't have the volume mm -hmm. anymore. So that was that first year we actually, um, had a uh, shop that we put in place where they made gowns and masks because you remember PPE mm -hmm. and the lack of was a big issue in the early days so we produced our own so a lot of our employees were going over to this shop and literally cutting out patterns and assembling gowns mm -hmm. for the clinical staff and um, it was really difficult to you know a lot of people lost a lot of their PTO mm -hmm. during that time frame and we were trying to work with them so that they did not lose that much. Now, it's the complete opposite of that. Mm -hmm. Now that people have left and uh, where it's difficult to backfill positions, we don't have the staff. The staff is a, is a big issue. We've got more volume than we've ever had for mm -hmm. the amount of staff that we have. Mm -hmm. um, and so managing staffing resources has been a huge challenge. This is not managing resources as we knew it back in the 80s and 90s and the 2000s. <laughs> this was on steroids. Mm -hmm. this, was, this was a much bigger issue. And, and I would have to agree with your comments about uh, the second biggest thing was, was um, dealing with the morale. Um, in the revenue cycle, I will tell you that in the early days of the pandemic, um, we had one of our favorite employees in the revenue cycle, and in fact, in the entire organization. She had been named employee of the year for the entire hospital the year before. Mm. Um, and she died of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, she, her husband had gotten COVID. She came down with it within 24 hours. They both ended up in the hospital. They both died with, uh, within 24 hours. Mm. And it was heartbreaking. Our staff was very um, demoralized and upset about that. And, um, we attended the funeral and spoke and did all of that, um, but it was but it was very heartbreaking and and very demoralizing. And then we had a second employee mm. that was an access coordinator in the emergency room, and she came down with COVID and also died. I w I spoke to both of them over the phone uh, right before they went on the vent, and mm -hmm. I had a chance to tell them both thank goodness that I called when I did but you could hear the struggle in their voice and I was able to tell both of them how much they meant to everyone they had ever been in contact with and that we loved them and to hang in there and do everything you know so those were very difficult situations mm -hmm. uh, for our, our staff and um, maintain and, and post all of that 
we are kinder and gentler to each other now than ever before because we've had that experience. Um, and But still morale and burnout and all of those issues are definitely mm -hmm. something that we have to worry and work with mm -hmm. and be very mindful of. Um, every one. chance we get to every celebrate day. anything, mm -hmm. we celebrate it. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, those would be my two. Thank you. Matt. Similarly to, to uh, Georgianne, I'd have to echo what she said. Um, managing the human capital aspect of it, I had several temp resources that we had employed at the time. They were scheduled to be temp to perm, um, and uh, we unfortunately had to make a very difficult decision. I had to walk up to those employees right before we sent the staff home and say, I'm sorry, you don't have a job anymore. Um, that was easy with. I say easy, it was easier with the temp resources. We were fortunate enough to not have to furlough anybody as an organization, um, but I still had to cut my temp resources down. So those were open FTEs that I never got back. Um, and so we had to manage through all of COVID, short on FTEs. It seems like we were perpetually short on FTEs. It didn't matter what we did, we were always short on FTE. And then similarly, trying to manage the employee morale the engagement was there they were engaged in their job they wanted to be at their jobs um, they were very fortunate for their jobs but their morale was in the tanks um, you know I have uh, a couple of employees that um, two that lost their spouses um, one of them lost their um, special needs child um, as a result of it and uh, you know that she was battling COVID at the same time as a result and I remember spending just time on the phone with her 15 20 minutes here and there she could hardly speak because she had just been discharged after coming off of event and um i i've never been on event but apparently it's incredibly difficult to talk mm -hmm. um for quite some time afterwards and i just remember spending time with her and just, um, both of us just crying on the phone um mm -hmm. because she didn't know where to go she had just lost her husband and her special needs child mm -hmm. um and she said what do i do and um you know, I said, well, I, I don't have the answer to that, um, unfortunately. Um, she said, well, all I know how to do right now is work. Mm. Um, and I'm just gonna work. And uh, she said, can I, can I call you? I said, you can call me anytime. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, but having those very, very difficult conversations and it, it was pervasive across the team. Um, and really all of us, we've all had similar stories. Um, or it, at least we know somebody with similar stories. So it was really hard keeping their heads up and keeping mm -hmm. their chins up. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Last but not least, Jay. Yeah, I mean, I hate to say I echo the same sentiments again, but I mean, it, it sounds like a, a broken record. I mean, I think for me, it's absolutely it's the staffing um, and productivity aspect of what COVID has done to our revenue cycle here, really managing um, uh, staffing and volume, uh, morale and burnout. I mean, those are the, those are the big ones today. I mean, that we, we certainly uh, share that 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 sentiment among, um, you know, it's 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 gone from you know, early on, we, we had the unfortunate uh, aspect of, of some furlough time for, for the revenue cycle staff, uh, particularly on the back end of the revenue cycle, billers, uh, follow-up clerks, coders, cash posters, et cetera. Um, and, and then uh, it, it's, we, we've maintained sort of our, 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 our stretch kind of in the patient access, uh, pre-financial clearance space uh, throughout this. Um, and, 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 but it's, there's been burnout. So obviously, you know, we, we've retained, brought back some services to, to the, again, ramp back up on the back end of the revenue cycle. And we've really never let off on the front end. Everyone just experienced that morale and burnout, you know, and, and trying to maintain, we've, we've had loss internally, um, you know, and it seems like, um, you know, we're working uh, a number of FTEs short in every single department for aforementioned reasons. And, and so that affects morale um, among the managers here. You know, it's consistent pep talks about uh, cross training and being able to pull people from here to share there, uh, even across organizations. We've got, um, of course, multiple facilities here. And so we've, we've you know, we've cross trained and we share where we can uh, to help offset some of that. But it, but it's, it's you know, we feel like the, the end is not quite here yet. We, we can see it from here, but we, we're not, we're not experiencing that. So. You know, those things are really impacted how we do business here. We want to take care of our patients uh, and our employees as their family. Um, we want to take care of them and their lifestyles as the be best way we know how, including their health and their, and their you know, spiritual and physical health as well. Uh, but those have been some significant challenges that, that I never thought I would see in my career uh, here now. 
Um, and, 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 you know, again, I think we're almost on the back side of it, but we're still um, creatively working ourselves through it. And, and, and um, you know, if we can maintain this current volume that we've got and, uh, and, and all, we, we began to look at some retention uh, uh, strategies to maintain our staff and, and potentially to recruit some additional, you know, I think we've got some solutions there in place, which may help bolster who we have. Um, we, we may be on the back end of it, but uh, those are mine. And again, um, just uh, an echo of what I've already heard. Yeah, and I think a lot of other leaders would echo the same sentiments as well. Um, I am going to open to question and answer just for a couple of minutes because I know we're holding everybody up from happy hour. But um, thank you all to our fabulous panel here. Uh, you all have been great throughout our prep and even today. Um, I would like to mention that um, our healthcare practice has developed a rural health leader affinity groups where we can discuss these same types of issues, challenges, uh, ways of uh, resolving those issues and challenges. If you are interested in participating in the affinity group, please feel free to reach out to me while we're here. Um, but I'd like to open it up for question and answer. Anyone? Yes, ma'am. Did you all hear? Yeah, I heard that. Well, what other data are we looking for to make those changes? Um, I think for me, um, one of the number one things is hearing from um, the staff. What what are they looking for, and why why are people leaving um, their employers? You know, and if we can figure out exactly why they're leaving and what they're looking for, that that would be great information for us. The volumes themselves, you know, when you look at the volumes to the ED through all those other avenues um, and entry points, and then you look at the back end, the claims, the denials, I mean, there's all kinds of things to look at in terms of data. Um, but we are, like Vanessa said, asking people when they're wanting to leave, we ask them. We're looking at, um, if they say they're overwhelmed, we look at all the tasks assi assigned to them and divide it. We look at um, retention bonuses. We look to see if they stay, can they cash out a percentage of their PTO in addition to their retention bonus. We look at the creativity, but there's all kinds of data to look, and it isn't just, um, you know, when you look at, at the, the workforce and how short we are, and then you look at all the volume and the, all the extra things that are happening, the new codes that come out, the new denials we're experiencing, and that's where, you know, me, honestly, I'm looking at outsourcing clinical denials because it's just, it's massive in, in my place, so. So I'll take that in a little bit of a different direction. Um, we are actually looking for some um, technological answers to some of this because we don't think that we're going to be able to ever get back to our sustained staffing that we once had. Mm -hmm. um, the FTEs, I mean, we're down 12 to 15 FTEs, and, and it's hard to get that back on board. So we are looking at EPIC's um, patient portal, which is called MyChart, to see what percentage of our patients are currently using um, online check-in, and are they doing all of those pieces? They can already go out there and you know, sign off on their um, HIPAA forms, their consent forms, they can make their payments, and literally all they would have to do when they arrive on campus is come to, the, to that uh, registration area and we would have a fast track checkout lane where they just get an armband and they go straight to their area. So we think taking some of that volume off of um, the, some of the pressure mm -hmm. off of the current staff that we have because they do feel the pressure when they're used to having eight outpatient registrations areas and we're down to five and they've got patients that are waiting that are trying to, you know, and we're used to having no more than a 10 minute wait and that's when mm -hmm. our flag goes off. Now that has changed <laughs> and so it would really help the staff to put some things like that in place so those are some of the things that we're looking at. And we're looking at, real quick, because yeah. that just jogged my memory, we're looking at all the optimization points as well in EPIC. We have EPIC. So we're looking not only at my chart, but we're looking at denials. Do we have it built out to its prime? And so we're looking at optimizing across the whole spectrum. For the whole rev cycle. Yep. Yeah. 
We've shifted a little bit from a uh, perspective of what is the wh what does the organization have to offer the employee um, when they're coming on to what does the employee want. Um, so not so much of here's what we have to offer, take it or leave it, but at the same time take a step back organizationally and say, what are you, Mr. and Mrs. Employee, looking for? What do you want out of the organization? And then how can we partner together to create what you're looking for? Jay, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the full question. Um, but, but I think as it relates to maybe data, and I'm, I'm piecing it together, but I think as it relates to data, try and help turn to, to, to drive down turnover, you know, I think we need to look to human resource departments as being a big, a big, re big asset for that internally to help us aggregate that data and determine what, what causally is, is driving that. Is it dissatisfaction related to pay? Is it, um, you know, is it burnout? Is it um, uh, not being trained effectively? Um, you know, what is it exactly that, that we're, we're battling and how can we make strategic or come up with strategic solutions to, to solve those problems? Uh, today and then I think it's one of the things we are looking to try and do better here is is aggregating that information um, as we experience that turnover so we can potentially mitigate that in the future. You know just curious has anybody done an associate satisfaction survey since COVID? <laughs> just have you? <laughs> I can't wait for the results. <laughs> <laughs> That's a separate panel. <laughs> Any other questions for our panelists? <laughs> Empathy, uh, empathy. Mm -hmm. And so, what's the question? What are we doing with those people? How what do, what do you see? Yeah. People that, you know, sometimes people just need a shot, right? And they'll, yeah. they'll impress you and they'll really step up. And they, but they may be they may be timid or they may be hesitant for whatever reason. They don't have a degree or they, you know, have never had anybody in their lives that let that sort of you know model that for them. What do you look for? Um, for, for me. Um, I look for just a couple of things. My number one thing is that they genuinely care about people. Because um, if you're going to come to work in health care and you don't genuinely care about people, it's not the right place for you. Um, and then after that they genuinely care about people, I want to know that um, they are detailed and want to make a difference. So I always say that, you know, the reality when we're talking about people leaving and people staying, Nobody's going to be compensated well enough in health care for the money to be the thing. I mean, really, that is just, they're not. Um, the reimbursements are not that great, and they're not getting better. Um, so I, I have to know that that person is more interested in making a difference than um, getting rich. There's always a handful of people that step up naturally and have the initiative, have the drive, have the personality, have the, you know, the mannerism about themselves, and um, you, I find that everywhere I go, and well, it's. And re recently, I did identify someone at Tanner that has that. Um, she's a little shy of the management piece, and so I'm just coaching her through that and waiting for the perfect opportunity for her to step into a role. But um, you know, they they show themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You just have to be able to identify them quickly and start grooming them and that's our role i mean we've all been groomed and so now we need to pass that on so. i can add to that bill thank you uh, for pointing that out but uh 20 years ago i met valerie when i was at decap medical center and i was actually her executive assistant i had not earned my bachelor's degree uh, but she saw something in me um, within six months she promoted me to managed care analyst and in 2005, I went back to earn my bachelor's, went on to earn my master's. Two things for me, it was uh, the people we were helping, but also my family. And then also because Valerie saw something in me, and it's always important when you see that person, you're their champion, because yeah. sometimes they take, it takes a little nudging 
you know, to say, I see this in you, and I know you can do this, so here's what you need to do. I can quickly add to that is skill over, I'm sorry, character over skill, hands down. I, if somebody has the, the kind of that following that iceberg model, right, they have this much skill sticking out of the surface, but they have a truckload of character underneath, that's the kind of person that I want to hire. I want that person on my team. I want that person to be able to be molded and developed because I don't care how much skill you have. I can teach you the skill. I can't give you character. I can't give you better character. I can't fix your character if it's busted or broken, right? Um, so character over skill, hands down, all day long. Drive, motivation, ambition. Yeah. I think those three things are very important. Mm -hmm. And just to add to that, I know um, when Forbes does their survey of what is it that um, companies look for in their top um, people that they chose over the years, the number one thing that they said was attitude. Attitude made the difference. It kind of goes back to what Matt said. You can teach a person the job, but attitude, attitude is just who you are. <laughs> all right, well, I think we can wrap this up now. Thank you again, panelists. Thank you all very much for your time. <laughs>